Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and today we're going to talk about potassium sparing diuretics. And as always, whenever you get done watching this YouTube video, you can access the free quiz that will test you on this medication. So let's get started. As we've been going over these medications in this pharmacology series, we have been remembering the word nurse because this allows us to remember those important concepts we need to know for exams about these medications. So first we're going to start with the name. The name of the drug tells us how the medication works, which lays the framework for understanding everything else. So we're dealing with potassium sparing diuretics. Well, that name right off the bat tells us we're dealing with a diuretic, so we're going to be some way altering how this nephron is dealing with sodium. And if we mess up how it's dealing with sodium, we can alter the way the body's going to reabsorb water. But this diuretic is potassium sparing. So it actually spares potassium. Compared to those other diuretics we've talked about in this series, like loop diuretics and thiazides, they wasted potassium. So this one's actually going to spare it. So let's talk about how it does that. Well, potassium sparing diuretics work to inhibit the sodium and potassium exchange that's occurring within these cells that make up the distal parts of the nephron. And we're specifically talking about the late parts of the distal tubule and the collecting duct. And what it's going to do, these medications, is it's going to affect the sodium channels. So to help us understand how these medications are affecting the sodium channels, let's talk about our nephron. So if we're dealing with any type of diuretic, it's really, really high probability that these diuretics are going to somehow affect some structure within this nephron. Like with loop diuretics, they affected loop of Henle. With the thiazides, it affected the early part of the distal convoluted tubule. So our nephron, just to recap, there's millions of these little structures with within your kidneys. And they're like the functional unit of the kidney because they help our kidney work and produce urine. So it starts up in here in the glomerulus. It's going to filter your blood as blood is received. And it's going to, in a sense, drip down what it filters down into Bowman's capsule. And it's going to start going through the parts of the nephron. And each part of this nephron, you can see them in different colors. We have the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and then the collecting duct. Each part is really assigned its own role for tweaking that filtrate. So what's going to happen to the filtrate, hence what will eventually become urine, is that it's either going to take ions and water and put it back into the blood, that's what we call reabsorption, or the blood is going to secrete things it doesn't really need into the filtrate so it can be excreted, that's like secretion. Or, and then eventually it's just going to leave the body and be excreted as urine. So in a sense, your nephron's like maintaining homeostasis of your fluid, electrolytes, water, and waste in the blood. So how potassium sparing diuretics work is they alter those sodium channels that make up that late part of the nephron, specifically that late distal tubule and the collecting duct. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna alter how sodium is actually going to be reabsorbed out of that filtrate to go back into the blood. And remember, if we're keeping more sodium in this filtrate within that nephron, which is eventually going to become urine, we're gonna keep more water with it and that will provide that diuretic effect. So to help us understand that a little bit better, to be able to visualize it, let's look at that process of what's happening with how like those ions actually cross over from the filtrate to go into the blood because that's the process that these drugs are manipulating. So here we have an illustration and this middle area represented in pink represents like the cells that make up the distal tubule and the collecting duct. And within these cells, you have to have these channels and these pumps to facilitate the movement of these ions so they can cross back and forth. Over here represented in red, this red area, this is our interstitium slash blood. And it has, you know, ions and other substances hanging out in it. And some of those substances want to get over here to the filtrate. And over here in the orange, that is represented with our lumen, the inside of that nephron slash the filtrate. And again, it also has ions in it that want to get over there to the blood. So to do that, it has to use those channels and pumps. One thing we want to concentrate on is this sodium channel. So the sodium channel, just like its name says, allows sodium to leave the filtrate and go into the cell. 
but once it's there, it needs to get into the bloodstream. So in order to do that, a sodium potassium pump will help it do that. So what that, this does is it takes the sodium, pumps it over there into the blood, but it has to exchange something for that sodium it just put in there. It has to take potassium and hydrogen ions and move it in the opposite direction. And it will go this way. And this is occurring to allow that to happen. So we have sodium channels and potassium sodium pumps. However, whenever we throw on a potassium sparing diuretic, it's going to stop this channel, that sodium channel, from doing that. So you're not gonna have sodium leaving this filtrate going in over here. So more staying in the filtrate means more water is gonna stay in the filtrate, we get that diuretic effect. However, it's going to alter how this sodium potassium pump works. It doesn't have very much or at all any sodium to pump over into the blood. So because it's not gonna do that, it's not gonna have the exchange of the potassium leaving the blood along with those hydrogen ions and going into the filtrate. So you're gonna keep more potassium in the blood. Hence, it's potassium sparing. So one thing I want you to remember with potassium sparing diuretics is that they're one of the diuretics that keep potassium through that process but patients can have hyperkalemia where their blood level of potassium is increased. So remember that. Now there are two different types of potassium sparing diuretics. They will all work together to achieve these same results, but they will do it in different ways with what they influence. So the first type I wanna talk about are called epithelial sodium channel inhibitors. These drugs directly inhibit this sodium channel. So by doing that, it's going to cause cause more sodium to stay in the filtrate, which will draw more water and will have that diuretic effect, but it'll spare the potassium because we didn't have that exchange with sodium and potassium via that pump. So there's that risk of hyperkalemia. And some drugs that fall into this category of potassium sparing diuretics are triamterine and amylaride. And the second group of potassium sparing diuretics are called aldosterone antagonists, sometimes called aldosterone receptor blockers. And just as their name says, is that they antagonize aldosterone. So they're gonna work against the effects that aldosterone would try to create in your body. Now, what does aldosterone do normally? Aldosterone causes your body to want to keep and reabsorb the sodium and the water. So it'll tell that nephron, hey, I need you to reabsorb sodium and water in exchange for wasting potassium and hydrogen ions. And one way why your body would want to do that is to help with blood pressure management. The blood pressure falls too low, aldosterone can help increase blood volume to help increase blood pressure. But how these drugs work is they tell aldosterone, no, you're not gonna do this because aldosterone influences the number of these sodium channels and these sodium potassium pumps. So if we're limiting their number, we're gonna be limiting how this whole process is taking place. So they have the same effect like these direct epithelial sodium channel inhibitors did with their diuretic effects. They're just doing it under the influence of aldosterone. And these drugs include spironolactone and aplurinone. Now let's talk about what these medications are used for. What do they treat? Well, because potassium sparing diuretics alter how we reabsorb sodium and water, they can be really beneficial in treating high blood pressure hypertension. They can also help patients who have excessive fluid volume where they're having edema and swelling related related to like heart failure, liver impairment, or maybe nephrotic syndrome. They can also treat hypokalemia, where you have a low potassium level in the blood due to a side effect that's related to maybe the patients on a loop diuretic or a thiazide. So they may put them on a potassium sparing diuretic to help prevent that. And they can be used to treat 
hyperaldosteronism, specifically the medications that antagonize aldosterone. And medication that's most commonly prescribed for this is spironolactone. And with hyperaldosteronism, the adrenal glands are producing too much aldosterone. And if we do that, what's going to happen? We're going to be keeping lots of sodium and water in our blood, but we're going to be wasting lots of potassium. So the patient can have high blood pressure and hypokalemia. So we throw on this aldosterone antagonist. This is going to help make it where we're not keeping so much sodium and water so we can lower the blood pressure and we won't be wasting so much potassium so we can keep our potassium levels stable. Now one thing I want to point out about potassium sparing diuretics is that they tend to be the weakest in their diuretic effects compared to the other drugs that are diuretic like loop diuretics and thiazides because they don't have such a profound effect on how we're dealing with decreasing sodium reabsorption. Like with loop diuretics, those are very powerful because they're dealing with a part of the nephron that really plays a huge role in reabsorbing lots of sodium. This isn't really the case with potassium sparing diuretics, which is why a lot of times potassium sparing diuretics will be combined with either like a loop diuretic or a thiazide diuretic. Now let's wrap up this lecture and let's talk about the nurse's role, the side effects and education pieces for the patient who may be taking a potassium sparing diuretic. So we have learned that these medications medications are going to increase urination because they're altering how we're reabsorbing sodium, which hence affects how we're going to deal with water. So because they're going to be urinating out more fluid, they're at risk for dehydration. So as a nurse, we have to watch out for that. How can we tell our patient is dehydrated? Well, we can look at their vital signs. How's their blood pressure? If their systolic is less than 90, that tells us that we've depleted their fluid volume a little bit too much. Or how's their heart rate? Is it increased where the body is trying to compensate for that low blood pressure? Anything greater than 100, they're a tachycardic. How's your patient acting? Are they really thirsty? Are they fatigued? They have mental status changes? This could indicate that they are dehydrated because of those signs and symptoms. And you wanna teach the patient how to identify that if that's happening to them at home and to report that to their physician. Also, we wanna monitor their intake and their output. We want to make sure that they're not putting out so much fluid compared to how much they're taking in because we don't want to dehydrate them. Plus, we wanna look at their renal function, that BUN and creatinine. That tells us how well our kidneys are really working to filter our blood. And if we dehydrate them too much, we can cause some renal issues. And potassium sparing diuretics are not for patients who have renal failure. Another thing we're watching out for are electrolyte imbalances. And what was the big electrolyte imbalance I told you to watch out for? Is hyperkalemia, because these medications spare potassium. So a normal potassium level that you definitely wanna put in your memory is 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. So anything greater than five, we're getting in hyperkalemia territory. So what are some signs and symptoms that your patient's potassium level may be high without really even looking at the lab result? Well, you wanna make sure you're looking at their EKG. How do their T waves look? If they're tall and peaked, that could be an indication that they're in hyperkalemia. Remember that, that's a big test question that they like to ask about fluid and electrolytes. Also, how's your patient reacting? Are they reporting muscle cramps, muscle weakness? Are they having difficulty breathing? Or do they have paresthesia where their skin feels like it's tingling and burning, they're nauseous, they're vomiting? Also, teach the patient to recognize these signs and symptoms as well. Of course, they can't recognize the tall peak T waves because they don't have an EKG monitor at home, but teach them these other things. Also, you wanna teach your patient to avoid foods high in potassium because we're already keeping potassium. We don't want them to just go and eat lots of food rich in potassium. So to help you remember foods that are high in potassium, remember the word potassium. And this includes foods like potatoes and pork, oranges, tomatoes, avocados, strawberries, spinach, fish, mushrooms, and musk melons like cantaloupe. In addition, you want to tell your patient to avoid those salt substitutes because those actually contain potassium. And many patients who are taking potassium sparing diuretics may be taking it for a heart condition like heart failure 
or high blood pressure and they've been educated, watch your salt, watch your salt. So they may use a salt substitute not knowing that it's really high in potassium. So educate them about that as well. Now, some medication interactions that you definitely wanna watch out for. Again, like I said, patients who are taking potassium sparing diuretics may have heart failure, so they may need to be taking an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. And those medications can increase potassium as well. And we talked in depth for why that was if you wanna check out those videos. So you wanna be watching that, looking at the potassium level, looking for those signs and symptoms that, hey, the potassium level may be high. Also, NSAIDs can cause that as well if they're taking something for pain that can increase potassium levels. And lastly, another thing is about drug-wise is lithium. Because we're altering how the nephron is working and reabsorbing and excreting and everything, we can alter how the body can actually clear lithium where it could actually build up in the system. So the patient's lithium levels would need to be monitored closely because they're at risk for lithium toxicity. And a normal lithium drug level that you want to remember is 0.5 to 1.2 millimoles per liter. So anything greater than that, there is a risk of lithium toxicity. And some miscellaneous side effects that you wanna remember as a nurse so you can teach your patient is that some of these medications can upset the stomach. So they may wanna take this medication with food or right after they have a meal to help decrease those signs and symptoms. And these medications can produce an anti-androgen effect. And we're mainly talking about those aldosterone antagonists, specifically spironolactone, because this medication affects the androgen and progesterone receptors. So some patients may experience gynecomastia, menstrual problems, and sexual dysfunction. Okay, so that wraps up this review over potassium sparing diuretics.